Hello and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. This is our first podcast of 2022. Happy New Year to everyone. I hope you all had the opportunity to celebrate, reflect, relax, however you like to mark the beginning of a new year. This week also marks the anniversary of a somber day for the country, the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. It has been a year since a group of Trump supporters violently entered the Capitol and temporarily prevented the 2020 Electoral College votes from being counted and certified. In the immediate aftermath of the attack, it appeared that Republican leaders were maybe ready to break ties with then-President Trump once and for all. His attempts to overturn the results of the 2020 election were apparent, as was his support of the people who entered the Capitol and his reluctance to stop them. But a year later, Trump still appears to be the de facto leader of the Republican Party, and those within the party who voted to impeach him over January 6th are pariahs. So today, we're going to take a look back at the year since the attack, what we've learned about the events of the day and leading up to it, how it's shaped our democracy and the party since, and how likely future political violence may be. Joining me to discuss, our editor-in-chief, Nate Silver. Hey, Nate. Hey, everybody. Also with us is politics reporter Alex Samuels. Hey, Alex. Hey, Galen. And tech and politics reporter Kaylee Rogers. Hey, Kaylee. Hey, good morning. Later in the show, we're also going to speak with Right Line Watch, a group of scholars that monitors democratic practices in America, their resilience, and potential threats. I know that we have a serious show today, but just to kick things off, you know, how's everyone doing? Did everyone enjoy the holidays? Was it restful? Yes, apparently too restful. We're still asleep. (laughs) <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Restful, yes. It was a virtual like, let's have a bunch of friends go to Mexico. Then it became, let's have people stay in New York, but we'll uh, do the show and this after party. Then the show was canceled and the after party was canceled. And then somebody got COVID. And then it just wound up being me and my partner getting dinner, which was entirely pleasant. But, uh, but you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that you're... That experience was was the experience of various people across the country, this kind of weird holiday season that felt like it was going to be normal again, and then in in many ways wasn't. Um, Alex and Kaylee, how was your holiday? Mine was good. Um, I think I said this on the last podcast, but I got boosted. Um, Excellent. Minor symptoms, but my New Year's (laughs) Eve plans kind of had a similar trajectory. I ended up just hanging out with uh, some friends and I learned how to play Texas Hold'em and is it called like die or di- dices or whatever that game is I learned how to play that and I won five dollars so 2022 was off to a great start yeah you're on your way <laughs> <laughs> uh you could you should play Nate <laughs> we should have a five I mean if you're inter- game, if yeah. you're interested now that I know how to play Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm glad everyone had a nice holiday. Let's begin with our favorite question, good use of polling or bad use of polling. In the year since the January 6th attack, many pollsters have asked Americans what they think about democracy itself. Is it working? Is it in danger? So for today's example, I want to ask about a new poll out from USA Today and Suffolk University. The Hill wrote up the poll with a headline stating, quote, eight in 10 worried about the future of democracy in U.S. The survey shows 51% of Americans say that they are very worried about the future of America's democracy. 32% say they are somewhat worried, and only 15% say they are not worried at all. So at first blush, it looks like many Americans are in agreement in their pessimism about our system of government. But the question here is, does this question mean different things to different people? Does one aggregate response to this poll tell us anything? So essentially, of course, is this a good or bad use of polling? Who wants to kick us off? Well, I think in this case, it's a good use of polling because we do have that context in the poll, because they also asked respondents about their thoughts on the big lie. And I think that really demonstrates the sort of... (laughs) parallel universes that that America is living in and that both sides are really worried about democracy, but for very different reasons, Um, with those who believe in the big lie worried about democracy because they think that elections are being stolen and stolen in front of our very eyes. Uh, And the other side being concerned because they think that 
people are responding to this in a negative way and, and starting to erode democracy as a, a way to kind of respond to that fear of election fraud. So I, I think this is good use of polling. And I think it's really important, even when you do the aggregate, although there's two different reasons behind it, if 80% of the country is worried about the future of our democracy, I think it's worth noting and, and looking into. As Kaylee's kind of getting at, there are two separate phenomena here. And the reason why Republicans are worried about democracy are not the same as the reason Democrats are and are generally speaking kind of less grounded in reality, frankly. Um, there are contradictory data points on how concerned Democrats are. There are some polls that show that a lot of Democrats are not that concerned, actually. They got their president elected. Democrats control Congress, albeit barely. Um, so that's actually like not the same from poll to poll. Um, and we can talk in the next segment about why that might be and why necessarily rank and file Democrats don't seem to feel the sense of urgency. But I mean, there's nothing wrong with the poll per se, but it's a little vague um, if you're just talking about the what and not the and not the why. Yeah, um, as Nate was getting at, you know, it's hard to propose solutions when Americans are divided over the perception of democracy itself, including, you know, whether it is even under threat, why it's under threat, and who is responsible for that threat. I was kind of, you know, on the fence about this poll, mainly because it didn't say anything that I don't think we already knew. Um, you know, especially among Republicans, there's this discontent and disillusionment with the current political status quo, which has led to confidence in democracy slipping. But as Kaylee and Nate were both getting at, the poll doesn't tell us, you know, what it is Republicans need in order to feel as though democracy isn't in danger. Yeah, I guess I'm curious, like, what does it mean to be worried about the future of American democracy? When people answer this poll, are they thinking... I don't like American politics right now. That's a pretty, I guess, simplistic view. And, and probably they're thinking a little more deeply about it. But like, what does it actually mean? Do 80% of Americans think that our system of government is going to end? Well, CBS News had a similar poll. It was released a few days before this one. But they asked the people who felt like democracy was threatened what they believe the biggest threats were. And they also asked those respondents to rank whether these threats were major or minor. And what they found is that the people who felt like democracy was under siege were most concerned with three things. And those three things were A, the potential for political violence, B, uh, people voting or casting ballots illegally, even though we know that happens on very rare occasion, and C, uh, the influence of money in politics. I guess given that, Alex, as you mentioned, there are very different reasons that people may be concerned about the future of American democracy. And as you said, Nate, some are more grounded in reality than others. Like, it seems like a flashy headline to say 80% of Americans or more, it's 83% of Americans are fu are worried about the future of American democracy. Is that like too alarmist? Is that properly alarmist? I don't know if that's the right framework <laughs> for it, right? I mean, this is, you know, Ironically, like, it's not up to Americans to vote on how worried they are about <laughs> democracy. And to some extent, I'd be more alarmed if people were less worried, right? At least in theory now, there could be some guardrails against certain things that um, that state legislatures might do, for example. No, it's, you know, you it's mean? good. Well, if people are just turning a blind eye to things, then, um, then, you know, people could get away with more, right? If the state of... I don't know. I mean, hypothetically, although, again, remember, we have this big partisan split in why people are worried, right? Hypothetically, if no one cared about this, the state of Wisconsin could just say, we passed a new law that from now on the state legislature will appoint Wisconsin's electoral votes, right? Um, you know, they could do that probably under the Constitution. And, like, um, you know, what prevents that? Well, it would be unpopular, presumably. Um, and so the more people are concerned about threats to democracy, the more of a cost there might be on that, right? Or the more of a um, norms might be against it potentially. So yeah, I mean, you should be more worried when people are less worried about something that actually is harmful. Right. I think also Alex makes a good point where by lumping it all together, it maybe elides the point that whatever solution there might be that would make people feel better about democracy, that's only going to work for you know, I guess half or so of the of the people that are worried. Um, if if you pass a bunch of laws that make it really difficult to vote, that might 
although we haven't seen this yet, assuage some fears of people who are concerned about voter fraud, but those who are worried about voter rights will be even more concerned and vice versa. But I think also, I mean, especially from that that CBS poll that you mentioned, Alex, democracy is sort of obviously a very big concept that covers a lot of things. What we're talking about for the most part here is elections and concerns about how elections are run and whether or not votes count and whether or not people are able to actually vote. And then election subversion being kind of like the the more sinister uh, outcome of that. These are all topics that we're, we're going to discuss momentarily. Um, but all in all, how do we rate this poll? And I would say the Hill headline, as I mentioned, was 8 in 10 worried about future of democracy in U.S. The USA Today headline was different. It was a year after January 6th. Americans say democracy is in peril, but disagree on why. So maybe one of those is a good use of polling and one of them is bad. I give the poll three and a half Yelp stars. Or you can't give half stars on Yelp. Um, three stars. Given inflation, that's pretty low. I mean, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't eat dinner at that poll given that rating. By the way, this gets into my, my pet peeve now where like rating systems where any rating apart from the top rating is considered like an insult. You know what I mean? I think are useless <laughs> rating systems. But yeah. <laughs> I mean, would you eat dinner at that poll if it was rated 3.5 stars? I have a lot of hacks for for Yelp, right? First of all, if the people who gave it a low rating were eating brunch, then the restaurant might be good, actually. <laughs> because people who eat brunch and post reviews on Yelp are, are dumb. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wait, I love this. It's a hot this take. Perfect. Yeah. You want... I'm interested, I mean, nothing wrong with brunch, right? But like, I'm interested in the opinion of dinner eaters, unless it's like a breakfast place or something, right? Brunch eaters just uh, provide a lot of noise, right? Yeah, you eat brunch to have fun, right? Not as like a culinary adventure. And as like a somewhat serious foodie, then like, I don't want brunchers polluting my dinner reviews. I mean, this kind, this almost makes sense. This is such a hot take. <laughs> the somewhat serious foodie who has dollar slices of pizza? Is that... <laughs> <laughs> Again, you want to you want the high end low play, right? Dollar slices. <laughs> you want the high end sushi amakase one night, and then the one dollar slice of pizza the next night. That's where that's where <laughs> my strategy to everything really. Um, brunch eaters of America. I'm curious to hear your rebuttal of Again, Nate's I, extremely hot take, impugning like, your judgment. I of like brunch to a degree. I just don't want people. You know, but they're not. You're not doing it for the food for brunch, right? I think you have a point in that. Used to like. Day drink and see your friends. Right. Nothing wrong with that, but like, yeah. Even the best brunch, like, doesn't necessarily tell you much about what a dinner service is like at that restaurant. There are other cues. Like, if someone uses the term, like, hands down, like, oh, this is hands down the best fried chicken I've ever had. Like, no one ever uses the term hands down unless it's like a fake Yelp review, right? That's a dead, that's a dead giveaway. No one ever uses that phrase in real life. I have never reviewed a restaurant in my life. So I do always wonder, you know, like who are, has anyone on this podcast ever reviewed a restaurant? Yes, I did one last month. My favorite ramen spot is apparently under new ownership and is terrible now. And I just felt the need to let people know because they didn't change the name. And I was very disappointed when I went back there. All right. So that tangent aside, it is a middling use of polling. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, it's, and a middling use of ramen. I'd say it's a good use of polling, bad use of ramen. Yeah, I, I prefer the U, going back to the poll. I prefer the USA Today headline slightly over uh, the other one that you had mentioned, Galen. But because the poll didn't give a lot in terms of like solutions and you know why Democrats think democracy is where it's at and why Republicans think it's where think it is, you know. Because it was lacking in some aspects, I, you know, kind of put it middle of the road leading toward bad use of polling. Fair. Yeah, I'm left thinking, okay, 80% of Americans think that the future of American democracy is in trouble. Uh, What does that mean? And maybe we will be able to address that in our next segment. So let's move on. It's been a year since we all sat down here at 538 to live blog the results of the runoff elections in Georgia's two Senate races and ended up watching a group of pro-Trump extremists attack the U.S. Capitol on live television. I want to kick things off by drilling down on what exactly happened that day. And Kaylee, one of your beats here at 538 is extremism. So in the year since that day, 
How has our understanding of what happened evolved? Right. I mean, it sort of, again, depends on um, your existing viewpoint, because once again, we have sort of parallel universes where people have very different ideas of what happened that day. Um, the, but the fact is, we sort of reached a fever pitch of all of the rhetoric around the big lie that had been continuing to simmer since the election. And a lot of anger, a lot of passion among people who had come to D.C. that day. And Trump's speech really kind of tipped them over the edge. I mean, we see this in the court filings from individuals who were charged uh, in the attack. They straight up say, like, I was just there to protest, and then Trump told me to go to the Capitol, so I did. It was a really unique moment in in time, a unique moment in history uh, that hopefully we won't see again, um, but it, it reached a moment where it was completely unprecedented and just the, the emotions and everything ran so high that we ended up with this really monumental attack on our Capitol. I think it is easy to forget the part that Kaylee was talking about, which is the incitement part, right? Um, you know, one question is why this hasn't been repeated, and it may be because you didn't actually have the active president of the United States actively inciting people to, <laughs> we have to do something about this, right? After a months-long campaign to undermine the integrity of the vote counting process. We talked about the scaling on the pre-holiday episode, um, but the extent to which Republicans have uh, not moved on from Trump. I mean, I guess it seems obvious in advance. I don't think it necessarily seemed obvious at the time. I mean, you did have um, a decent number of Republicans vote to um, impeach and remove Trump, clearly not a majority, right? But it seemed at least possible that the tide would shift. Usually parties um, do not want to have much to do with their with their losing presidential candidates. I think we'll talk about this in future parts of this show, but like, in some ways, the fact that like, January 6th has not become, I don't think, central to the nation's political consciousness, um, I think is interesting, maybe not as surprising. Um, I think it's something that like kind of people who are, are big consumers of political news think about a lot. I don't think it's the kind of thing that like um, the quote unquote average American necessarily puts on that pedestal. There is polling saying that, for example, Americans do not see January 6th is a September 11th like event. They see it as something which is um, serious, but not at that level. And so that's interesting, potentially, too. You can kind of blame the media for that or kind of we, we could talk about that later. But like those are just some random thoughts I have. Yeah, I think the and this might, you know, it feels almost naive in retrospect that any of us had this idea at the time. But there was certainly a sense on that day that this might be an event over which we could all agree was a negative thing. You know, we all saw this happen in real time as a country. And Republicans' sort of initial response to it was not to defend Trump, not to defend the the, the insurrection. And But even on that day, and I, I, I've done some writing on this that's, that's forthcoming, you know, there was messaging happening starting to bubble up already to completely reframe it. And by reframing it, we've got you know, a, a big section of the country that doesn't see it as a negative, horrible thing that happened, that sees it as either a false flag or, you know, some kind of conspiracy thing, or just, you know, patriots that were protesting and, and voicing their opinion as their as their right to do. And that, you know, it was no, no worse than, you know, tourists visiting the capital, that kind of thing. So those are the kind of views that we ended up happening, which is such a big shift from sort of the reality that we were all in that day. Nate sort of waved at this earlier, but I think immediately after January 6th, um, I had this feeling of, oh, like this will be the straw that breaks the camel's back for Democrats, like especially like the more moderate and centrist ones. Like surely now they'll be on this side where they feel, you know, the GOP is the party of Trump we are not going to work with them anymore. Let's just get our priorities passed and like call it a day. Um, but that hasn't really seemed to happen. Um, it really seems like there are some Democrats in Congress, Biden included, who really still post January 6th, like cling on to this like idea of bipartisanship. And I wouldn't have imagined that in the immediate aftermath 
of January 6th. So I don't know how much January 6th really shaped our politics or kind of the makeup of Congress or how, you know, certain Congress members feel about working across the aisle. I think the only thing that could have made a difference would have been Trump's reaction himself, because Trump remains so incredibly popular among Republicans. A majority of Republicans still want him to run um, for president. And and the idea that the GOP was just going to turn their back on this extremely popular figure was just unrealistic. However, if for some reason (laughs) Trump had decided to come out more strongly against it to say, hey, look, this was too far. I don't condone what happened. This was a terrible tragedy. If that had been his messaging, I think we would see a totally different response from his base and sort of we'd have kind of a collective uh, reply to it. Instead, he was very defensive of it, um, you know, has been defensive of the individuals who have been charged in the attack, saying that they've been mistreated, um, and obviously continues to beat the, the election fraud drum, which spurred this whole thing to begin with. He's taken zero responsibility. Um, and that messaging is really powerful. It kind of sounds like you're saying that the whole reason, much of the reason that this didn't turn into a 9-11 type event in the nation's consciousness is because of Trump. That, But like, does he hold all of the cards in terms of how America understands attacks on its seat of government? I mean, is there like... Could the Republican Party have taken a different path? Uh, Could the Democratic Party have taken a different path? Could the media have taken a different path? I mean, the reason why it's not a 9-11 style event is because, like, it was ultimately unsuccessful. It's as if three of the four planes had been stopped before um, kicking off and, like, the fourth one crashed into the Atlantic Ocean or something. Um, You know, we can debate how close it was to being successful, but it's kind of... It's hard to get people um, to worry about, like, a near miss. Um, Unless you're kind of like a political connoisseur, right? The original SARS, right, was a near miss. It ultimately wasn't like a global pandemic. It was regional and not that bad, right? It didn't necessarily make people, like, that conscientious about the next pandemic. Hell, even with COVID, there still hasn't been that much of a drive to, like, fund research into future pandemics, you know? So it's like, it's like... People have a high threshold for wanting to change their points of view and and ways of life. And the fact that, like, I mean, the thing is, it is, like, obviously very visually very disturbing, too, right? Um, but, I, you know, I don't know. I think um, there's not, like, a good way to put it. But, like, it fell just kind of below the threshold of turning dramatically violent where... Many people were killed, and I kind of assumed at the time that either protesters or police or members of Congress that, you know, that there would be dozens of fatalities or something, and it didn't quite hit that threshold, and and, and I don't know. Um, well, doesn't it also have to do, though, with uh, an attack from an outsider versus an attack that kind of fits into your internal domestic political debates? I think that's right. You know, I think the fact that the call was coming from inside the house makes it much more complicated. It's so much easier to demonize sort of the other um, with someone attacking, whereas these were Americans. These were um, people who feel very strongly about their country and their democratic rights, clearly, that they came to D.C. to, to protest. So that complicates it. And I think Nate's right that the the level of violence did obviously doesn't rise to that level. And to really contextualize it, you have to think about it in the context of history. You have to think about what could have happened. You have to go back and review, you know, video footage that we've seen since that really kind of captures just how dramatic and how violent and and how close we were to something even more catastrophic it was. At the time, you know, it was hard to get footage. I, I was watching live streams of people that were actually there, but a lot of people were just kind of watching whatever cable news could get their hands on sort of from above and, and sort of this distance view. And it wasn't until we started having tapes released as part of the, the hearing and as part of the trials of those who were arrested that we, we started to see really just how close we were to disaster. And if you're not keeping up to that and, and you've already maybe written it off in your mind as, as not that big a deal, you're not going to recontextualize it. 
I also think there's a difference in how the law treats like foreign versus domestic terrorism cases. And so I think the rioters, by my understanding, were always expected to receive, you know, less of a legal punishment um, than, you know, compared to 9-11, the Muslims who were prosecuted on nonviolent charges of providing like material support to foreign terrorist organizations. But I feel like one big difference why, you know, January 6th did not reach like this, you know, 9-11 Uh, level significance beyond what's already been said is because after 9-11 like U.S. Muslims resoundingly denounced like Islamist militia groups and I feel like they faced pressure even to apologize for attacks that many had nothing to do with Um, but as we talked about earlier the GOP today has accepted little to no blame and has tried to really distance themselves from the attack. I do think that if the rioters were predominantly non-white, then maybe the response would have been slightly different too. And just to really quickly respond to your question, Galen, about Trump holding all the cards, I don't want to give him 100%, you know, responsibility and credit, but I don't think we should undermine the role that he played both in instigating this attack and in shaping the response to it after the fact. Um, Obviously, the GOP had other options than to just side with him and and go along. Um, I think the Democrats also could be more forceful, especially in response to, you know, trying to pass voting rights legislation. There there are other paths. It's not all just about Trump, but I do think that he plays a significant role here. Right. There was nothing like uh, the 9-11 sense of bipartisan unity after January 6th, and I think Trump played a role in contributing to that. But I don't think, again, that this all falls on his shoulders. It's also an event that's hard, I think, for people to put into a category. Um, There's this debate about whether it's a coup or not. Um, A lot of academic experts, a coup attempt. Some academic experts say, no, it's actually not because the military, importantly, wasn't involved. Other people might say, you know what, that's really kind of splitting errors, and maybe um, it doesn't mean this definition, but clearly it's in the same kind of um, general constellation of events as a coup. Some people call it like an auto coup or an auto golpe is a Spanish word or something like that. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Um, but um, but it's a lot of things at once, right? Um, you know, I think it's estimated that something like 10,000 people were, um, were in this protest slash riot slash insurrection in Washington, D.C. that day. Um, Some of them were not particularly nice people. You have groups like the Proud Boys, right? But you also probably do have, like, Mary from the accounting department (laughs) thinks the election was stolen and goes there and it was peaceful, right? Um, And so it's lots of different things at once, and that kind of, the amorphousness of it allows people to manipulate themselves and others into, into how they describe it. I think that's a really good point. And we don't really have a modern comparison to try to fit it into, you know, it it doesn't, it's not really comparable to 9-11 for all the reasons we've already covered. And, you know, the the closest comparison is like from the war of 1812, when the Canadians burned the White House down or the British, depending who you ask. Um, That's not useful for people to make that kind of comparison. I think we, it's such a unique event in modern times. It is unique. But I think that a lot of people coming Off of January 6th, the main question was, will something like this happen again? What will future elections look like now that this one has been so delegitimized um, by the then president? What kind of answers can we provide people? Like, why hasn't something like this happened again? The extremist groups that were involved in January 6th, um, you know, I know that you've covered them, Kaylee. What do they think about the state of America now? And have they kind of given up? What are, are they still making plans for future political violence? What does post January 6th uh, democracy look like? I do think that there was so many factors at play here that made this kind of like a perfect storm event, which is why we haven't seen things happen again. Um, And Trump's role in that is obviously a key factor, but the tensions and the dissatisfaction that was simmering and built up to that sort of, you know, rolling boil of January 6th, those are still there. Um, And if anything, getting worse. Uh, There's a deep uh, distrust of elections among many Republicans. 
their belief that the election was stolen or illegitimate is not reducing at all. It's not starting to fade in any way. And concerns about the legitimacy of, of 2022 and 2024 remain pretty high. Uh, there's polling that shows that people think that if their preferred candidate doesn't win, that's a sign that there's something wrong and there's election fraud happening. So the, all of those simmering concerns remain and I don't think are going anywhere fast. There's sort of different perspectives on how to address that, whether that's through a, a Voting Rights Act at the federal level or, you know, Republicans believe that passing some of these voter restriction laws is going to help quell those fears at the state level. But we've seen they continue. Um, so I'm not sure what the solution is, but this is sort of the, the status of the ecosystem at this point. People are still very unhappy and, and deeply believe that there is flaws in the election system. Political scientist, I, I believe his name is Robert Pape. I don't want to butcher his last name, but he had a really good op-ed in the Washington Post looking at what motivated uh, the rioters. Um, and he essentially said it was racism and white resentment that uh, drove a lot of them to the Capitol that day rather than actual fear that the election was stolen. Um, so going off of that, um, he made the point that a similar mob could be summoned by Trump or a Trump-like figure. Um, and that's because the country is moving towards becoming a minority majority, uh, or sorry, majority minority nation. Um, and in, on top of that, right-wing media outlets continue to stoke fear about this, you know, great replacement, um, which could mean that the racial and cultural anxieties that many of the rioters had uh, will not go away. And as Kaylee mentioned, you know, there's this record number of bills uh, proposed that aim to essentially restrict voting access or enable partisan interference uh, in elections. We already know that a lot of these bills, I guess now laws, were motivated by the big lie. Um, but a major consequence is that they could help Republicans tilt elections in their party's favor. Obviously not uh, very good for a healthy democracy. So I don't know about you know, the risk that this could happen again, necessarily. But I think that some of the underlying fears that the rioters had, um, those aren't going away. And that is pretty worrisome. The thing that's also tricky, and I think Kaylee's kind of getting at this, is like, um, January 6th and like, quote unquote, the threats to democracy are like not perfectly parallel, right? If you ask kind of like... Um, you know, the 10 most eminent scholars of erosions to democracy, what threats are you most concerned about in 2024 and beyond? I don't think they'd rank a repeat of January 6th at the top. I think they'd more talk about, like, about what if a state legislature doesn't approve the result? You have a dispute in Congress, right? Um, we can talk about gerrymandering and voting rights and whatever else, right? But, like, it's kind of like, I mean, there were debates ahead of time about, like, in 2012 or 2020 about, like, kind of how could the election be stolen potentially. There were things like, well, um, the GOP will stop the vote count once these kind of late return ballots get in and the courts will support them. And that's how that's how the election will be stolen, right? Um, people, I mean, there are people, you can go back and look at, like, some prescient Twitter threads about people predicting a January 6th like outcome, but that was not the most common scenario that people kind of thought. And so, um, so, you know, to what extent is when Democrats have a commission on January 6th, to what extent is that, um, helping people to be more concerned about democracy and threats to it versus like not being quite on the nose to what the threats might be next time around. Um, you know, I mean, I think maybe kind of, one lesson from January 6th should be that, like, when you have a set of actors, meaning Republicans in this case, who are not committed to democracy, then you don't necessarily kind of know what form it will take, right? It might be something unpredictable that isn't the exact scenario that you plan for. And so what that means, I think, is difficult. It probably means you need to have, like, a lot of different defense mechanisms at different parts of the, of the, of the chain of events, right? No, I think that's right. And there's also a, a bit of a risk of hyperbole on the left is similar to what you see on the right, where there's this belief of like this widespread conspiracy to, to steal the election, which is like so unlikely and, and fears about certain outcomes that, that seem unlikely on the left, rather than focusing on what's actually happening, like focus on what laws have already been passed that are concerning, focus on what state legislators 
have said they plan to do, that's what we should be concerned about rather than sort of fanciful scenarios of, of really kind of scary outcomes. And, you know, so much depends on outcomes of elections as well. And so raising the alarm about what could happen, if that then doesn't happen, it, it sort of undermines the alarm, even if there was, it was a perfectly rational and, and reasonable response to what we're seeing. It's really hard to make predictions. Um, and so covering this with the right amount of skepticism and alarm is a tricky balance. All right, let's leave things there. Thank you, Nate, Kaylee, and Alex for joining me today. Thank you, Galen. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Up next, we're going to speak with Bright Line Watch about the health of American democracy, according to surveys of both Americans and experts who study democracy. Since 2017, a group of democracy scholars at Bright Line Watch has been tracking what Americans and experts think about the health of democracy through a series of surveys. We last spoke with them in June when a notably high number of Americans, 37 percent, showed support for their region of the country seceding from the union. Back then, we debated the usefulness of such a poll. The group just released updated polling in December, and Brendan Nyhan, professor of government at Dartmouth College, is here with me to discuss. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. So maybe we'll get to the secession question a little later, but more importantly, thinking about the events of January 6th a year ago and the kind of main polling that you've been doing over you know these past four or five years. Have we seen any real reaction to January 6th itself in terms of worries about democracy? You know, it's it's hard to say. The, the term democracy, I think, is one that's difficult to parse. Even experts often disagree about its exact meaning. And to the public, I think it can seem like an abstraction. What I would say about um, the change since January 6th is I'm struck by how little there has been it did seem like there was a moment in the immediate aftermath of the attack when there would be a, a, a full-scale repudiation of the events of that day and the effort to overturn the election that led up to it. Instead, we've seen public opinion uh, largely locked in place. We still see um, a, a dramatic partisan division in views of the legitimacy of the 2020 election. Um, you know, those are uh, remarkably stable uh, in our polling. and. Even more worryingly, the problem is getting worse in the sense that we now see a greater partisan division and confidence in the 2022 election um, than we saw immediately prior to the 2020 election. So when people tell you that they're worried about the integrity of future elections, what are they worried about? So the, the question that we're, we're using here is, is confidence in the count. So we're essentially asking people, do they believe these false claims that uh, election counts are inaccurate and that there's widespread voter fraud or electoral fraud to manipulate the literal election totals that are being reported in terms of who won and who lost? Um, so that really strikes at the heart of democracy itself. The lack of confidence in those totals is very worrying. Now, we don't know how far people's beliefs in those statements will go. But we saw on January 6th, it can go quite far. Um, and if we go through a whole election cycle where those claims are repeated, where they burrow deep into people's minds, I do worry about um, the basic norm of elections, which is that uh, both sides respect the results. The losers accept the legitimacy of the winning side's victory. Um, without that, we have nothing in a democracy. Um, and right now the polls show um, that that confidence uh, is is worryingly divided along party lines. What percent of Americans say that they doubt the vote will be counted as intended in the next election? Yeah, so we uh, we found that uh, sixty two percent of Americans were very or somewhat confident that votes will be counted as voters intended in the November twenty twenty two election. So that top line number is similar to what we saw back in October twenty twenty when it was fifty nine percent. Um, however, we see this dramatic partisan split. Back in October of 2020, we found 66% of Democrats expressing confidence in the nationwide vote count compared to 58% of Republicans, an eight percentage point difference. Now we see 80% of Democrats expressing confidence in the vote count compared to only 42% uh, 
of Republicans. So we have this much wider partisan difference. The top line number hasn't changed, but we're now seeing uh, only a minority of Republicans expressing confidence in the vote count. And of course, that's critical because we need both sides of an election to accept its legitimacy. What is there to be done about this? Because it seems like anything that would, as we've discussed earlier in this podcast, anything that would allay the fears of Republicans would stoke the fears of Democrats. Anything that would allay the fears of Democrats would stoke the fears of Republicans. And then that's just the perception category. There's also the question of, you know, how do we shore up our democracy against any actual threats to it? Does Brightline want to have answers here? Well, there are things you can do. Um, so one thing we did in our most recent report is survey experts for their views on how to reform American democracy. And a plurality uh, supported uh, reforms that could be undertaken without a constitutional amendment, um, which are obviously the ones that are most feasible given the difficulty of that amendment process. Um, and we asked them to evaluate a number of reforms that might um, help strengthen American democracy. Now, they don't directly speak to, the, to your question, Galen, in terms of confidence in elections themselves. You know, for that, I would say, uh, you know, a, a very large number of prominent political scientists have supported, um, uh, you know, the Freedom to Vote Act in, in, in Congress as the most direct way to um, strengthen American elections. Now, that won't fix public confidence in elections, but it will protect the elections themselves. In other words, it will help protect the process from the consequences of this distrust. Sim similarly, fixing the Electoral Count Act, which is vulnerable to manipulation, potentially, as we saw on January 6th, um, would help reduce the consequences of this distrust in the election system. Um, the reforms I was alluding to before um, might help change the electoral incentives in some cases that cause Republican elites to uh, question the integrity of the electoral system when they're defeated and to double down on an approach that uh, seeks continued minority uh, power, uh, you know, the differential minority power they currently enjoy. Some of these changes might uh, impact that. Changes to redistricting laws, electing the president by the national popular vote, expanding the Senate, and so forth. So there are there are things that could be done. Whether they're politically feasible in the current environment, of course, is a different question. This is maybe a cynical question, but this is a kind of uh, maybe pessimistic conversation. How much of a priority is having a democratic government for Americans? Meaning above and beyond what they their policy preferences or partisan identity may be, how much do Americans want to live in a country where you win based on a majority of people supporting you and your ideas? So if you ask people, do they support democracy? They typically say yes. Um, they rate, well, there's a, a standard survey question that asks on a scale from zero to 10, how, is important, how important is it for you to live in a democracy? And the mean is something around an 8.5 in the United States. So people say living in a democracy is important. And in fact, at Brightline Watch, when we ask people about specific principles of liberal democracy, um, we see widespread support across party lines. The question, though, is whether people will prioritize those democratic principles over their own preferences, over the policies that they would prefer to see enacted and the people they would see prefer to see holding office. And that's where the rubber meets the road. And unfortunately, we haven't seen um, the American people willing to turn against their party when it does violate those important principles or when it does uh, vi uh, threaten the stability of the democratic system. Um, there's research on this that asks people to choose between two hypothetical candidates and, and actually tests how often they will um, vote against who might otherwise be their preferred candidate because of um, uh, one of the candidates expressing some statement or position that violates democratic norms. Um, and in those cases, people do seem to penalize candidates, um, but not as much as we think. And that's with hypothetical candidates. Now imagine it's someone like Donald Trump, who people have an emotional connection to um, and a longstanding history of support for. That becomes uh, much more challenging. The final thing I'll say about this, Galen, um, is uh, ultimately people do have more important things going on in their lives. People are worried about how the economy is doing. They are worried about COVID. Abstract concerns about democracy 
are just not going to be top of mind for everyday people. And that's fine. Um, the problem is when we have a political system that encourages politicians to attack the system itself. And we have a political class that fails to reject those candidates and parties um, that would undermine the stability of the system. Um, that's always been how democracy uh, has been supported. The political class has to defend those norms or they can fall. That's very directly the lesson of the book, How Democracies Die by Steve Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt. There's a screening function that the political, political class plays. And um, it's up to those of us in the media and in academia and in politics to defend these norms, knowing that the average person is not thinking about them in the same way. That's okay. We still have to defend them. Yeah, I looked at some research by Matthew Graham and Mylan Sabalik at Yale, and it, their research suggested that it was, you know, the portion of the electorate that would make their voting decision based on democratic principles primarily was like three and a half percent of the electorate. And so that may, they may seem really alarming. I don't know, maybe it is to you, but it, you're saying like, that's nothing new. That's how people operate. It's the elites that are responsible for upholding democracy. And the elites are going to have to step up because it, it's, it's simply unrealistic to ask uh, the public to put democracy over all else. We need a political system that is robust to these kinds of threats. Um, and right now, our two-party system is. Has this dynamic changed at all in the sense that people feel like losing has become more and more unacceptable? Do people today feel like their party losing an election is a greater harm to them than in, pa than in past elections? It's certainly plausible. We don't have the longitudinal data to answer that scientifically, but I, I think many people have that feeling that politics seems existential to the most committed partisans, that um, affective polarization, for instance, is at record high levels. People feel very negatively about the other side. So the idea of the other side holding office seems unacceptable. And maybe it's OK to overlook uh, violations of democratic norms in order to keep your side in power. Now, um, I can't tell you that that, um, that chain of reasoning is more prevalent now than it was in the past, but it certainly, uh, it certainly seems plausible. And actually, let me just add one more caveat on that, um, which you can cut out if you like. Um, but just to say, it's really important when we have this, when we, when we have this conversation, Galen, for the audience to know that um, we're really talking about the United States in the post-civil rights era, right, from 1965 on. We were not a full democracy until we enfranchised all of our citizens. Um, and uh, the stability of American democracy, of course, overlooks all the ways we were undemocratic prior to that period. So it's, it's just an important caveat to, to all of these uh, conversations. Um, you know, black people, obviously, in particular, did not uh, get to have a choice about who uh, they accepted in office, for instance. Your recent report shows that partisans underestimate how committed people from the other party are to democracy. Um, basically, Republicans don't think Democrats care about democracy. Democrats don't think Republicans care about democracy. But in fact, they do. How did you test that? A and why, why are partisans so pessimistic? Yeah, this is a really... Uh, interesting line of research has become more common in recent years. Um, uh, social scientists have started to think about what you might call meta misperceptions. Um, you know, that people have misperceptions about, you know, how misinformed the other side is. And similarly, that they might have misinformed, they might be misinformed about the commitment of the other side to the political process and the norms, um, uh, you know, by which we decide who holds power. So in this case, we ask people to estimate the percentage of, uh, of people in the party they support uh, or identify with and the percentage of people on the other side who expressed, who said a given democratic principle was important. Um, and what we found was the expected pattern. People who, uh, when asked about their own side, percentage, they guessed the percentage of people who would say that principle was important was much higher than for opposition uh, partisans. They underestimated, in other words, the percentage of opposition partisans who affirm the importance of these democratic principles. Um, now, uh, we then corrected those misperceptions for a random subset of our respondents, and we told them the actual numbers. We told them, you actually underestimated how many people on the other side uh, support these small-D democratic principles. Um, 
we then looked at the uh, effect of that correction on their willingness to support various kinds of abuses of power um, while in office, right? So did this make people, in other words, less likely to say their own party should violate democratic norms? Um, we found an effect, but it was a very small one. Well, I guess that's maybe some optimistic news, although you said the result was limited. One thing that we talked about the last time you were on this podcast is political violence. And of course, that's particularly important when thinking about January 6th. You suggest in your most recent report that polling may have up until now been overestimating the Americans' willingness to resort to political violence because of how the questions were being asked and how Americans were thinking about those questions. What changes have pollsters made to try to maybe get more accurate results? And has it actually changed our perception of Americans' willingness to support political violence? Yeah, so this is an important uh, topic. You know, uh, we were deeply influenced by the work of uh, Nathan Calmo and Liliana Mason, who were really the pioneers in measuring um, support for political violence. Um, uh, they've done a number of studies in this area. They have a forthcoming book that will delve into these topics in greater detail. But the original version of their scale that got the greatest amount of attention um, asked people a series of questions about political violence, and it had um, four or five response options. And they would typically measure how often people picked uh, fully rejected violence. In other words, pick the single response option that most uh, clearly and fully rejected violence. And then uh, another set of political scientists um, led uh, by Sean Westwood, my colleague here at Dartmouth, um, pointed out some problems with this. Um, first, they were worried that inattentive respondents uh, were driving up expressed support for violence. So people who are uh, picking the middle of the scale or answering randomly would come out under this uh, design as uh, supporting political violence when they simply weren't uh, paying attention. And they worried this might be exacerbated uh, by uh, the use of a single scale. Um, and so following their, um, following their guidance, uh, we tested an alternative measure that first asked people, is violence ever acceptable or ever justified? And then if they said yes, we asked them how frequently or how often. There was a follow-up question that had a series of responses. Um, we also measured people's attentiveness directly. Uh, and then finally, we modified these questions to really specify what violence meant. That term was often undefined. And Westwood and his co-authors worried that uh, might lead people to indicate support um, for something, uh, but to really not have physical violence in mind. Um, and what we found is that when you make these uh, changes, the percent of Americans who express support for political violence is much lower. Uh, it does turn out to be the case that when you restrict your sample to attentive respondents, people who aren't just answering randomly, um, when you change the question wording to first ask, is violence ever acceptable or justified, and then have a, a, a scale for the people who say yes, and to, to pin down exactly what it is you're asking about instead of just using broad terms like violence, that the percentage of Americans who express support for political violence is in the single digits. So that's really good news for the world. And I think uh, reflects the continuing progress of our science in this area. The bad news is that still leaves millions of Americans expressing support for violence, even under these more stringent terms. And, uh, and, and in particular, we find um, on some questions, uh, you know, a disturbing percentage, for instance, of strong Republicans expressing support uh, for uh, violence to restore Trump to the presidency, for instance. So the, the percentage of Americans who, who really support political violence is lower than some previous estimates suggest, um, but there's still reason for concern. So previously, the estimates approached or were around 20 percent. And with this revised survey method, it's more in the single digits. That's right. That's right. Sometimes they were 30 percent or, or more. Uh, we think with this uh, improved methodology, the better estimates are in the are in the single digits. But again, single digits. Uh, single digit percentages multiplied by the population of the United States is still a lot of people. Um, you know, when you think about January 6th, it wasn't actually that many people uh, who were able to threaten the lives of people in the presidential succession and uh, and destabilize the, you know, the, the process by which we, you know, officially affirm the, the victor in the presidential election. So wrapping up here, 
you know, your name is Brightline Watch, the, the organization. How concerned are you all about future political violence in America? I, I, I can't speak for my all of my co-organizers, but I, I, I do think everyone feels some sense of alarm. Uh, political violence can be widespread without being widely supported. And it can be tremendously damaging, even if it's not frequent, uh, even if it's not, even if we're not in a civil war, we could have uh, real paroxysms of political violence um, that are very damaging uh, to obviously the victims of any violence that takes place and, and more generally to everyone who participates in the political process and has that shadow hang over them. I've been really struck by the reflections on January 6th and its aftermath and how it's affected everyone who works in the capital, political violence echoes. It reverberates even when it's relatively rare. So I do think we are alarmed. All right, well, let's leave it there. Thank you so much for joining me today, Brendan. My pleasure. My name is Galen Daruk. Tony Chow is in the virtual control room. Claire Bidigary Curtis is on audio editing and Emma Riley is our intern. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with any questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or a review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Thanks for listening, and we will see you soon.